So complex number is what we are going to start today. Okay, this is actually a new chapter to most of you. Complex numbers, right? Complex number is a chapter which is not taught in any of the boards. Probably, uh, I don't think so even in uh, IG curriculum. I think Madhav will be the best person to tell me on that. Um, were you exposed to or are you exposed to complex numbers? No? Right. So this is a new concept for all of us. And it is one of the most, I would say, feared chapter for an 11th grader. Now, for various reasons. Number one, yeah, of course, you do not have any prior exposure to it. Right? You, you might not have ever uh, studied complex number in your junior classes. Okay. Second thing is, it's a multifaceted concept. Multifaceted means it will have a lot of aspects which come from other chapters. For example, it will have some touches of trigonometry. It will have some touches of coordinate geometry. It will have some touches of vectors. So because so many concepts help you to solve a complex number problem, sometimes it makes the concept tricky also. Some, some may say, sir, it, it should make our life easy because yeah, you can use you know, multiple concepts from other vertical of mass to solve complex number problem. I agree. So both pros and cons are there. It makes life easy sometimes. It makes life simple, uh, difficult also sometimes. Now, first of all, why do we need a complex number? Okay. What was the need for a complex number? So as you all know, invention basically is an outcome of a necessity. Right? Necessity is an invention, is the mother of all invention, right? Hello, everyone. Hello. Good evening. Okay. Class started at 6, sorry, 3.45. So when we, when we were hunters or when we were primitive man, when we were food, fruit gatherers or seed gatherers or hunters, we only required natural numbers, right? So our quest for numbers were uh, you know, taken care by natural numbers, right? 1, 2, 3, 4. By the way, natural number itself is defined in different ways in different country. You would be surprised to know that in some countries, zero is also a part of natural number. Okay. Anyway, so why it is called natural number? Because it came very naturally to man, right? We use our fingers, you know, uh, we use sticks, we use straight standing lines to count, you know, uh, objects around us. So even a small child, a small baby who starts counting, he or she will start counting from natural number. He will never say 1.25, 1.36. He will never count those kind of numbers. But slowly man started doing some kind of barter system. Okay. So from food gatherers, we started living the life of, you know, uh, small traders. So let's say I am a trader. I gave, let's say Anurag five mangoes. Okay. So Anurag will say I have five he will he'll, he'll use a natural number to denote that five. But let's say I take away that five mangoes from him. How will he denote how many mangoes he is left with? If you're using natural numbers at that point of time, you will not have any number to denote that you are left with no mangoes or zero mangoes. So zero was put into the system. And when zero was put into the system, people thought that their quest for uh, numbers was complete or they had a whole set of numbers with them. That's why they started calling it as whole numbers. The word whole was because they thought they do not need any number at all. They have whole numbers, all the numbers I have in my world. Okay. But soon they were proven wrong when they started doing a little bit more business, when lending and borrowing started happening. So let's say I gave Anurag five mangoes and I demanded from him seven mangoes. Okay. Of course, Anurag has to borrow from someone. Let's say a person who has uh, you know, mangoes to lend to Anurag. So he will borrow two mangoes and give it to me along with the five he already has. Correct. So how do you show the concept of oh, Akash? <laughs> so Akash has more mangoes. Huh? So let's say Anurag borrows two mangoes from uh, Akash and he gives it to me. So how does Anurag show the fact that he has borrowed two mangoes? Okay. So it's your negative two. And because it's negative two, Basically, man needed integers. So whole numbers, again, it was bettered by the use of integers. Okay, I'm just drawing another circle. Okay. Okay. Now, man started doing farming. Okay, so man went into farming. So let's say Anurag again, our hero of the situation. <laughs> so let's say he had a farm whose uh, 
dimension was let's say 2 meter square hello what's uh, this small piece of land huh? 2 meter square is not even the size of you know the bed i'm sitting on <laughs> okay. so let's say 2 meter square land he had and anurag had three sons okay so when anurag was becoming old these three sons demanded that you should divide the land equally among us right because we are your natural you know heir of your land so how will he divide or how much land should he give to each of his son of course now you know the answer now you know that he should give 2/3 meter square to each one of each of his sons but do you think when integers were known this number 2/3 was known correct so man needed a number like this and therefore he started talking about rational numbers so let's say i have make another circle like this sorry for a crooked circle okay so he required rational numbers right q stands for quotient because you are taking one number divided by the other and the word rational also has come from the word ratio 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 of p by q so as you can see it's a p by q type of a number okay now let's say the same piece of land uh, anurag wants to protect from trespassers right he doesn't want anybody to enter his or encroach upon his piece of land so he goes to a person who sells barbed wires so how much barbed wire will he demand to you know cover up the boundaries of his uh -oh, cover up the boundaries of his let's say agricultural land how much barbed wire he will need now you know the answer is 4 root 2 correct because root 2 etc is known to us now that time when let's say irrational numbers were not into picture third was not into picture how else would he you know explain how much barbed wire he needed so he needed something called irrational numbers so there was another let's say you know circle i'll draw a small circle which is q complement q complement means other than other than rational numbers now when he got all these numbers he started calling all these numbers as real numbers why real because he could signify any real quantity around him by the use of these numbers whether it was the farm size whether it was the size of the you know bar wire he needed any length any dimension he could signify by the use of these numbers so they were used to signify real things which he had around us okay but slowly and uh, you know uh, gradually man started solving equations and one day anurag while he was solving equation he stumbled upon this okay which made him you know uh, think very hard that how can how can we have a number especially a real number whose square is going to give me a minus 1 so he was unable to solve such questions okay <laughs> i'm just giving a funny example where uh, this was not the real uh, you know in incident that happened it basically happened with a italian guy called uh, garilemo cardano cardano was a guy who was attempting to solve cubic equation just like quadratic equation there is a formula he was trying to come up with a cubic equation formula and in the attempt to solve a cubic equation cardano started you know stumbled upon these kind of scenario okay not a similar one but not a same one but a similar one okay so there he started pondering that i need to have a number whose square will give me a negative answer and there and there he felt the need of imaginary numbers there he felt the need of imaginary numbers now this word imaginary did not come very you, you can say on an ad hoc basis imaginary the word i basically was uh, chosen by euler euler was a swiss mathematician who basically gave this word but before that it was called latent numbers and all those stuff before they finally uh, decided that they are going to choose the word imaginary okay so there was a need for such things and hence these numbers came into existence now most of you would be knowing that we have already started talking about two dimensional complex numbers which are called quaternions okay so when a, one of the english mathematician hamilton he has introduced quaternions into the system lot of you know cryptographic work in the field of computer science has been done on quaternions and who knows uh, 10 years down the line or 15 years down the line your children or grandchildren would be studying this as one of the chapters in class 11th and 12th je may be facing questions on quaternions right so what i want to convey is the field of maths is dynamic right it is not like uh, you know something which has been already decided and you have to work only with it 
there are a lot of debates lot of changes are happening in the field of maths number theory L lot of research work is still happening okay yeah you read about that cotton yarns <laughs> uh, anurag uh, sorry pranav i don't want to waste time talking about things which are not relevant as of now for our je preparation so this is a brief history why complex numbers came into picture now what is complex numbers complex numbers are basically a bigger set which encompasses real as well as imaginary numbers okay so this is called a complex number we normally write it with a c with a slight stroke over it okay so real numbers are actually complex numbers imaginary numbers are also complex numbers and a combination of this is also a complex number so complex number is the broader set as of now it is more broader than your real number set okay so before i start going into more details about what's a complex number okay and what kind of uh, operations we can do it do on it i would like just to give you a brief idea about the content of our study so overview of our chapter what are we going to study under this chapter the first thing that we are going to study under this chapter is representation of complex numbers A representation of complex numbers okay there are three types of representation which i'll be discussing with you point form polar form and euler's form and we'll see how uh, one form uh, is helpful vis-a-vis -vis the other in certain type of cases we'll be also talking about operations on complex numbers operations on complex numbers this is going to be the elephant in the room because uh, is going to take a lot of time because we have operations of addition before that comparison addition subtraction multiplication division log square root nth power raising one complex number to the other all those operations will be taken care so i think operation itself would be around 2 and 1/2 hours of you know uh, subject matter for us under complex numbers third we are going to talk about third we are going to talk about the de moivre's theorem de moivre's this the pronunciation is de moivre de moivre's theorem okay so the help of de moivre's theorem we are going to talk about lot of things like finding the finding the nth nth power of of a complex number okay and how this helps us in studying the nth roots of unity in particular okay which also includes your cube root of unity including your cube root of unity including cube root of unity roots of unity okay <clears throat> next thing that we are going to talk about is your rotation theorem a rotation theorem and this is something where we'll be introducing a new type of formula to you called the coney's rotation formula coney rotation formula okay uh, this is a slightly tricky concept of all the four that we have discussed so far it requires a bit of practice we'll do that through questions not to worry next we'll talk about next we'll talk about the application of complex numbers application of complex numbers in geometry numbers in geometry okay and when i say that i basically mean how it is used to find find locus or you can say solving locus questions solving locus questions locus problems okay the last part that i have written for you this is a favorite of j j loves this like anything okay so they want you to understand all the operations that you are going to come across in complex numbers to the idea of locus locus is also a subject matter of coordinate geometry right so you would understand that how important locus becomes overall for you 
so this is in a in a nutshell this is what we are going to cover in this chapter uh looks to be simple only five concepts are there but each of these concepts are pretty long right a representation of complex number itself is going to take us one one and a half hours today okay and some of the operations we are going to introduce today in today's class so this is uh the overall uh content of your complex number chapter now how many classes will take for this i think three classes minimum it it may go beyond acha some of you have asked me about the dashera break uh, sorry not dashera break christmas break christmas break yeah so christmas break is basically not there uh we are giving however offs on 25th because that's the actual uh, christmas day so 25th if at all you have a class that will not happen and 31st and 1st being the last and the first day of the year and the next year that will be off but the bad thing is or the good thing for most of you would be even those classes will be compensated somehow before the the actual holiday so you may have to you know come on a non centum day for a class okay will 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 uh, put those dates uh, in in advance to you don't worry about it madhav yes you did not miss lot of things we just started talking about the overview of the chapter so you can treat this to be the very first slide okay all right so what is a complex number a complex number is actually a two dimensional number okay it is a two dimensional number a plus b i okay now here you are seeing something very you know interesting i what is i okay now i is basically the first word uh, the first letter of the word imaginary okay many people call it as iota also okay it is under root of minus 1 now what is this under root of minus 1 doing over here why do we need it see as i already discussed with you complex number is a two dimensional number it has got a real dimension to it and it has got an imaginary dimension to it let me explain this with the help of vectors i'm sure you all have done 2d vectors in physics correct you have all done 2d vectors okay let's say i have a vector vector p okay if i write the vector p or if my let's say vector p is such that i'm just giving a example to you let's say this vector p is in such a direction that in order to reach from initial to the terminal position you have to go 3 units to the right and you have to go 4 units to the top right how do you signify such a vector you will say sir dheera sir has taught us to write it as 3 i cap plus 4 j cap correct yes or no right absolutely correct i am not denying it absolutely correct now why 3 i cap and 4 j cap why didn't you just write 3 plus 4 you will say sir for two reasons first of all how would i know that this is a vector quantity second thing how would i know how much i have to travel along x axis and how much i have to travel along y axis in order to you know go from the initial to the terminal position right so this i cap and j cap are basically unit vectors which tell you that okay you are going three unit along the x axis that means you are covering that i unit three times and you are covering this j unit four times in order to you know cover the entire vector isn't it in the same way when you write any real number let's say you write a real number 5 you know actually you write 5 into 1 because 5 means this unit 1 has been written 5 times so this unit is very important when you are signifying any type of real quantity around you or any kind of a physical quantity around you 5 mangoes if i just say 5 how will you come to know which quantity i am talking about so one mango is like a unit and that unit is 5 times and hence you know okay he is talking about 5 mangoes that's almost you know 2 kg of mangoes if you talk about the bigger ones right so unit plays a very important role right so when we write any number there is a hidden unit called one there when i am talking about real numbers in the same way the unit for imaginary numbers is i so if i just write a plus b and let's say a and b are real quantities you will not be able to understand 
what is the real part of it and what is the imaginary part of it. Just like in this vector, if I just write 3 plus 4, you will not know how much I component I have covered, how much J component I have covered. So when I say A plus BI, I actually mean A into 1 plus B into I. So basically, I acts like a unit for signifying how much imaginary character that complex number has. Are you getting my point? One acts like a unit to show how much real character that complex number has. So it has both the characters. So I acts like a, you can say, distinguisher or you can say a separator through which you can understand that, okay, this complex number has B amount of imaginary character to it. Are you getting my point? Okay. So hence this I was chosen. And since they wanted to, it to resonate very closely with one unity, that's why they chose negative one under root because this could be, this could act like a very safe unit for signifying complex numbers. Now, many people may ask me, sir, can you write it like a comma B also? Because you know, people can understand that, okay, the first uh, element of the ordered pair is your real part. Second element of the ordered pair is your imaginary part. Yes, we definitely follow this uh, in, in practice, right? We, we also write complex number like a point. Okay, that is something which I'll talk about in some time. But is it clear that when you represent a complex number as A plus IB, A into 1 will behave as the real, B into I is the imaginary of that complex number. However, one thing I would like to emphasize over here that both A and B, even though A is called the real part of the complex number, I should not write belongs to, I should say equal to, and B is called the imaginary part of the complex number, even though this is what we name it, but in reality, A and B are real numbers only. Yes, A and B are real numbers only. I have seen people making a lot of mistakes while, you know, explaining it. When I say, tell me the imaginary part of this complex number. Watch out, listen to my question carefully. What is the imaginary part of this complex number? Many people say BI. No. Imaginary part of the complex number is just B. What is the real part of the complex number? A. Are you getting my point? For example, if I say, what is the J component of this vector? You'll say four. Don't say four J. <laughs> what is the real part? A. What is the imaginary part? B. Now, along with I, it becomes an imaginary number. For example, here four along with J becomes the, the J component. I mean, you can say the J, uh, uh, you know, uh, the component of the vector along the J direction. Okay. So here, please be very careful when you're using the word. Now that KVPY has done away with the interview, but if let's say, if you're appearing for a KVPY interview, such wrong choice of words will give you a negative in your points. Is this fine? So A is the real part, B is the imaginary part. Both A and B are actually real numbers. As you can say, let's say I take an example of two plus three I. Okay, two and three, both are real numbers. 2 and 3 both are real numbers. But we'll say real part is 2, imaginary part is 3. Imaginary part is 3. Okay, don't use 3i. Three, 3 is the imaginary part. Okay, so please be careful about the use of your terms. Is this fine? Now, this i, we'll talk about it a little bit more because we are going to speak we are going to speak not only I as a separator, but also I as a complex number, or you can say imaginary number in itself. So we'll talk about I. So we'll talk about properties of I. The first property that you would observe is that it is such a number which when squared will give you a negative answer. Okay, so I value is under root of minus one. So if you square it, you'll get a negative one, right? So let's not be surprised anymore because now we'll be going, now we are going uh, to see such kind of activities quite a lot. That square of a number can give me a negative answer. Okay. Second thing is, if you see, 
if I just raise some powers to I, let's say, okay, just keep watching these powers. Okay, you would realize that it is following a cyclic nature. That means after every change of four in the power, it is repeating its previous value. Do you see this? Okay, as you can see, i to the power one, i to the power five, i to the power nine, they're all i i each. Okay, so after every change in the power of four, it is regaining its previous value. Okay, i to the power two, i to the power six, i to the power 10, i to the power uh, 14 and so on and so forth. They will all will be minus one. Okay, so this is following a cyclic kind of a nature. So this is following a cyclic kind of a nature. Okay. Third thing that you would observe from here is that if you raise i to any power which is a multiple of 4 and being some integer, you will always get a 1. Check out this one. i to the power 4, i to the power 8, i to the power 12, i to the power 16. Okay. So if somebody asks you, hey, how much is uh, i to the power 4004? Without much waste of time, you can easily say it's 1 because this is a multiple of 4. So i raised to any multiple of 4 will give you 1. Along with it, you can also observe that i to the power 4n plus 1 is going to be i. i to the power 4n plus 2 is going to be minus 1. And i to the power 4n plus 3 is going to be minus i. Okay. So please make a note of this. So if i is raised to any power, which is leaving a remainder of 1 when divided by 4. That will give you an i eventually. i raised to the power any number or any integer, which is leaving a remainder of 2 when divided by 4, will give you a minus 1 eventually. And i raised to the power any integral power, which leaves a remainder of 3 when divided by 4, will give you a minus 1 i. Fourth property that you should note down. If you, if you, add any four consecutive powers of i if you add any four consecutive powers of i it is going to give you a zero i to the power zero is one because it comes under this category you know zero is a multiple of four madhav so i to the power zero will be one okay so this is very important please note down any four consecutive powers of i any four consecutive or consecutive you know, powers, you can say integral powers also, but it can work for any, any case. Power of i will always add up to give you a zero. What is the proof for this? Proof is very simple. Take an i to the power n common. It will give you 1 plus i plus i square plus i cube. Okay. And i square we know is minus 1. i cube we know is minus i. So 1 minus 1 cancels, i minus i cancels, giving you a 0. Okay. So these are the four important properties that we need to uh, you know, keep in our mind while solving questions based on i. Okay. Any, any doubt so far? Any doubt so far in whatever we have done? Okay. Let's take questions. Let's take questions. <coughs> Oh, oh, sorry. I think this is complex some uh, vector question. Go back to the desktop. Complex numbers. <clears throat> mm. So many questions that I need to start with the relevant question. Okay, I think it starts from here. Okay, let's do uh, these simple questions. Let me start with the first one. Evaluate this. That means uh, write it in a simpler form. Evaluate this. Or let me give you this question. If you have to write this as A plus B I, what will be A and B? What will be A and B? Let's start with the first one. Five or more consecutive term 
it will depend upon which is your fifth term because till four it will be zero no first one done very good okay so first one was i plus i square now i square is minus one i to the power of four is one in the denominator you'll have one again a minus one and this will be again a plus one so this will leave you with an i i means zero plus one i so your a becomes zero and b becomes one very good people have got it right uh let's do the third one third one is quite easy okay acha one more thing i would like to highlight over here when you say negative 6 under root it is basically written as root 6 i it is written as root 6 i okay so when you are doing negative of negative 6 it is basically negative root 6 i now go ahead and solve this question you have to write it in a simpler form okay prana very good so let's cube it if you cube it you get minus 6 root 6 i cube remember i cube is minus i so it will be 6 root 6 i so you can write it as 0 plus 6 root 6 i so a is going to be 0 and b is going to be 6 root 6 acha uh, provided i want to write it as a plus b i okay next one we'll do the third one i think fourth one we can take it for the later or we can do fourth one also no issues yeah third one what's the answer express this as a plus b i form express this as a plus b i form a uh, please put the question number so that i know you are answering for which of the above questions okay very good aditya pranav shares <coughs> so sorry very good okay now you have summation i to the power p from p equal to 0 to 300 so when you are writing it you write a p i to the power 0 i to the power 1 i to the power 2 i to the power 3 i to the power 4 let's put this in brackets i to the power 5 i to the power 6 i to the power 7 i to the power 8 let's put this in brackets and i'm sure you must be realizing why i'm putting those in brackets okay so the last few numbers would be uh, uh 300 i think 298 is a uh, no uh 96 300 is also multiple so i can have i to the power 300 i to the power 299 i to the power 298 i to the power 297 okay now if you see the reason why i have put them into bracket is because four consecutive will add up to zero so this will be zero this will be zero and all these numbers that you'll get will be zero each which property have i used which property have i used over here the fact that sum of four consecutive powers of i will add up to give you zero ultimately your answer will be i to the power 0 which is 1 okay so you can write it as 1 plus 0 i 1 plus 0 i is this fine okay uh let's do the fourth one let's do the fourth one 1 plus i by 1 minus i square okay now before we square it let us try to write it in a simpler form now uh, we have not officially done the concept of conjugate of a convex number but whenever somebody sees a problem like this the natural feeling that uh, he or she will get is let's multiply it with this okay the same feeling of rationalization will come in your mind correct okay so let's do this so when you uh, multiply 1 minus i with 1 plus i you'll get 1 minus i square okay and on the numerator you'll have 1 plus i to the power of 2 now what i wanted to discuss with you here is that 
normally when you have such kind of powers or such kind of you know uh, terms coming up we use our normal identity that we have learned a plus b the whole square there is no difference between uh, you know applying those identities to real number and applying those identities to a non real number or imaginary number the identities won't change don't don't worry about that so when you write 1 plus i the whole square you can write it as 1 square i square plus 2 into 1 into i the normal formula a plus b the whole square formula and in the denominator you have 1 minus of minus 1 okay now let us write down the values 1 square is 1 i square is minus 1 this is 2i divided by 2 1 plus 1 is 2 i minus i cancels 2 and 2 cancels so that will give you an i so the very first term that you have over here this is actually i square this is actually i square okay so uh without wasting much time without wasting much time if this is i square the other term has to be reciprocal of i square correct so if this is i square then this is 1 by i square because it is just exactly reciprocal of this term so i square is minus 1 i square again is a minus 1 so this will give you a minus 2 is this fine any problem in this okay one interesting thing which i forgot to discuss with you how would you get the same answer if you squared it at the start if you squared it at the start oh you can do that no difference multiple ways to solve the question now uh, madhav so you may decide you may start you may square the numerator you may square the denominator yes both the, that is also going to give you the same result no difference no difference at all now one very interesting fact one very interesting fact in fact it's a myth it's a it's a wrong notion that i would like to you to you know understand when we say under root of a into under root of b okay many people construe this as under root of ab okay please note that this formula works if at least if at least one of a and b is greater than or equal to 0 that means if both of them are negative this formula will fail okay how this formula will fail so let me uh, show you that so let's say i take a as negative 4 b as negative 9 okay under root of a would be under root of negative 4 which is actually 2i under root of b under root of b will be under root of negative 9 which is 3i okay so when you multiply them you will get 2i into 3i which is 6i square 6i square is minus 6 okay now if you claim that this is equal to under root of ab under root of ab in this case would give you a 6 okay and these two things are not equal that means this formula will not work under those circumstances so here is something very important for you to note down under root of a into under root of b would become negative under root mod a mod b if your a and b both are negatives if your a and b both are negatives okay please make a note of this so people who blindly use this formula for everything here is a word of caution here is a word of warning do not use this if a and b both are negative quantities here a and b both are negative quantities so the formula will slightly change now why does the formula slightly change because this convention has been derived from the concept of geometric mean which you will study in the chapter sequence series and progression now the moment somebody hears the word mean or the word mean itself was coined to show something in between so whether you talk about arithmetic mean geometric mean harmonic mean it basically is a quantity which is between two numbers right so if somebody says what is the geometric mean of minus 4 and minus 9 so basically i mean some of you would be already knowing it geometric mean is under root of ab correct so under root of ab just like arithmetic mean is a plus b by 
geometric mean is defined as under root of ab under root of full ab product now we haven't done that chapter yet so most of you would not be aware of it but those who are aware they would know that it is written as under root ab so under root of ab should give you an answer which is between minus 4 and minus 9 when i say between not exactly midway but somewhere between it so it must be a negative quantity right so how can my answer becomes 6 so this cannot be accepted as our right answer so it should be somewhere in between minus 4 and minus 9 and hence this change in the formula has happened because of that okay these are just conventions which are made by you know, uh, you know mathematicians to make uh, to give uniformity across the field of mathematics okay so very interesting fact note down i have seen even teachers making this mistake okay so uh, one question i would like to take up with you uh, let's pull out one from our <clears throat> yeah i'll put the poll on I'm now taking the attendance. So if at all you have left the call now, you will be marked as absent. So Sheikh, Madhav, Abhinav. So the question, as you can see on your screen, is a sequence which goes from i, 2i square, 3i cube, all the way till 100 terms. And this expression simplifies to which of the following? Two of you have answered so far. Good. Nice. Last 30 seconds, last 30 seconds and I'll close this. All right, five, four, three, two, one, go. All right, fifty percent of those who have voted have said option number A. Okay, next highest vote has gone to C. Let's check. See, uh, this is a special type of series which you will learn sooner or later in the chapter sequence series and progression which is called an AGP, AGP, AGP. It stands for Arithmetico Geometric Progression. Uh, there is a particular way to solve these kind of questions, which I'm doubtful that most of you would be knowing. So let me take this as an opportunity to tell you that. So if I write till 100 terms for this, it will be this, right? 
Now, in an AGP like this, first of all, why the name AGP was given? Because as you can see, <laughs> this kind of a series exhibits two types of uh, progression characteristic. One is an arithmetic progression. As you can see, the number one, two, three, four, da, 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 da. So this is showing you an arithmetic progression characteristic. And the second type is like it shows you the geometric progression characteristics. I, I square, I cube, I to the power four, da, 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 till I to the power 100. Okay. So when a progression, sorry, when a series shows both types of, uh, you can say, characteristic, we call those as an AG, arithmetico geometric series, okay? arithmetico geometric progression if you don't write a plus in between. So how do we uh, solve such kind of a uh, series? What do we do is, we first see what is the common ratio of the GP involved over here. As you can all see, the common ratio of the GP involved here is I, isn't it? Don't worry about the AP involved, just worry about the GP involved. So the GP involved has a common ratio of I, correct? So multiply S with I. So when you're multiplying it, write it once shifted to the right. For example, if you multiply this with an I right underneath this. If you multiply second term with an I right underneath this. If you multiply third term with an I right underneath this. Okay, and so on. So Ultimately, this will have 99 i to the power 100 and it will just shoot this particular last figure and become 100 i to the power 101. Correct? Let's subtract. Let's subtract. So s minus i s will be like s1 minus i. Take s common. Uh, consider a 0 over here if nothing is written and consider a 0 over here if nothing is written. So i minus 0 will be i. 2i square minus i square will be i square. This will be i cube. This will be i to the power 4 and so on. This will be again i to the power 100. And this will be, sorry, minus 100 i to the power 101. Okay. Now here if you see, there will be 25 such, you can say, you know, four terms. I'll just show you one more. So if you start grouping it, there'll be 25 such groups like this that will be created along with 100. Okay, so, so they will all be 0, 0 each, isn't it? Because we have all seen that, we have all seen that four consecutive powers of i will add up to give you 0. Correct? So i1, i2, i3, i4, 0. i5, i6, i7, i8, 0. i9, i10, i11, i12, 0. Like that. So if you go to i... Let's say 97, 98, 99, 100. They will add up to give you zero. Okay. So nothing is left other than other than minus 100, 1 minus i on the right side. Oh, sorry, my bad. 100 uh, i to the power 101. Sorry. And that also is 100 i to the power 101 is like i to the power 100 into i to the power 1. So i to the power 100 will become a 1 because 100 is a multiple of 4. Correct? So ultimately what you see is minus 100 i on the right side. So our answer here would be minus 100 i divided by 1 minus i. If you look at the options, none of the options so far resemble it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to slightly simplify this by multiplying with one, one plus I. So on the numerator, I will get this on the denominator. I'll get a one minus I square, which is two. So two and hundred will get canceled 50. And if you multiply uh, I inside, it'll give you I square, which is minus one and plus I. So this will give you 50 times one minus I which I think is uh, option number A. So Janta was absolutely correct. A is the right option for this. Is that clear? Any questions, any concerns? All right. Let's take one more question. Anybody has any question with respect to this? Sir, in the previous page, uh, what would have happened if one of the numbers were negative? Okay, you're asking me the previous page doubt. 
one of the numbers were negative only one of the numbers were negative right if only one were negative other is positive or zero you'll follow the first formula if both are negative both the formulas are you getting my point is that your question madam or are you talking about geometric mean when one is positive one is negative geometric mean when one is positive another is negative is not defined because both are real numbers and your answer will come out to be imaginary that i will talk when i do geometric mean with you sir i just checked the first four terms pattern can we do it for any such sequence yes are you talking about the approach that we followed the approach that we followed multiplying with the common ratio and subtracting it yes that is a widely followed approach it can solve any ags problem ags means arithmetic geometric series problem by the use of that approach <clears throat> yes if one of them is negative other is positive you can use under root a under root b is equal to under root ab no problem with that for example if you do under root of 4 into under root of 9 okay it is same as under root of 4 into 9 so this will give you 2i this will give you 3 this will give you under root of 36 which is equal to 6i and this is also equal to 6i both are correct so it is matching with our formula got it madhav is this what you want us wanted me to explain okay all right so next question that i have for you is <clears throat> if x is equal to minus 5 plus 2 root minus 4 simplify simplify x to the power 4 9x cube Plus thirty-five x square minus x plus four. Simplify means write it in a simpler format, or you could, or I can say write it as some a plus i b. <clears throat> okay uh how many of you are actually solving this question uh by the way this is 4i if i am not mistaken yeah root root of negative 4 is 4 2i 2 into 2 uh, 4 i right? how many if you are actually literally putting x value in all these places and trying to simplify i am sure most of you are doing that isn't it now let me cut you short on that if you are trying to do that because it is going to take a lot of time right you are not dealing with simpler powers raising it to a power of 4 cube etc that is going to take away considerable amount of your time okay so here is an approach that i would like you to understand 
Let us try to play with this expression. So let's take the minus five to the other side. Let's square both the sides. So if you square both the sides, this is what you end up uh, seeing. Oh, it was four i, my bad. Yeah. So you'll end up seeing something like this. X square plus 10x plus 41 equal to zero. Correct? Now, all of you please pay attention. I'm going to tell you a very interesting and shortcut way. This term, you treat it as a dividend and this term you treat it as a divisor. So this is your divisor. This is your dividend and divide it by using your long division method by using your long division method. I'll tell you why am I doing this? Just uh, be with me for a few seconds. So when you divide, you get X square. This is X to the power four, 10 X cube, 41 X square. When you subtract, you get minus x cube, minus 6x square. So put a minus x. Okay. Again, when you subtract, you get 4x square. Uh, let me copy this. You get 40x uh, plus 4. Uh, just put a 4. So 4x square plus 40x plus 164. And subtract it you'll end up getting minus 160 as your remainder, right? So what I'm trying to say here is this term, which you were actually trying to figure out what is this expression? It could be written in an alternative way as this into this, right? By Euclid's division algorithm, I can write this expression as quotient times divisor plus remainder, right? Now you must be wondering why at all I'm doing this is because when you're putting X as five, sorry, minus five plus four I here, that means you're putting X as minus five plus four I here also. But this guy, this guy is zero when you're putting X as minus five plus four I because this came from this fact. If this is zero, that means zero into something whatever it is, it will be zero and you'll be left with minus 160 only. So your answer will be minus 160. That's it. Right? So you don't have to put a minus five plus four I in every X and try to simplify that. That is going to take at least five minutes of your time easily. But this was just a case of a long division method, which will take one minute or so, and then you are done with your answer. Ah, <laughs> first of all, the word remember itself is a misnomer. Never remember anything. This method is basically, if you incorporate it while solving questions, that is what I can say is the right use of word. See, however, what I did was, I'm actually finding out the expression of this polynomial when you're putting X as minus five plus four, I correct. So this term, I wrote it like this. And finally, I realized that when you put minus five plus four, I into this, you will end up getting a zero as the answer. Correct. So what I did was I wrote my dividend, which is your, this term as this times quotient plus the remainder. Okay. Why did I do like that is because I know that this guy is going to give me a zero. So whatever is the, you know, uh, quotient, I don't care. Everything will become a zero and whatever is the remainder actually in that I have to put my value of X and get the answer. But since there was no X here, let us say, hypothetically speaking, let's say if there was some X term remaining, then you only have to evaluate that remainder part. You don't have to worry about the other terms because they are anyways getting multiplied to this term, which is zero and hence everything will become zero there. So remainder only will give you the desired answer. Getting it wherever what I'm trying to say makes sense. Okay. All right. So with this, we close the I chapter. Of course we have done a lot of properties of I and, uh, 
uh, we are ready to talk about now the next part of the chapter.